All right. Welcome, Aaron. It's just the two of us. But have I ever told you the story about Socrates? Socrates, um, Socrates is a would be in Athens. He always he would always be with students, um, teaching and things like that. And all he needed was one student to give an entire lecture. So if it's the two not two of us, that's a quorum. So today, this is the um, this is the view from outside my house. Last night. So I had to clean off, actually I didn't clean off my wife's car so she may get a little upset. I usually do that, but I was in a hurry. <laughs> okay, so today's case, is the door locked? Is this locked? Maybe just leave it open. It probably locks. Oh. Okay, it doesn't lock in. So today's case is a 61-year-old <clears throat> man um, with a four-day history of ataxia. And um, he he basically um, has Down syndrome, and he lives in a group home. And the group home, his uh, sister lives in the group home. His sister has his sister has Down syndrome, so does he. And they just walk around. They kind of mill about the house uh, by themselves. There are other people in the home, I believe, that also have mental deficiencies. And um, I think someone just comes there and takes care of these people. So this man, um, he has no guardian. Uh, he and his and his uh, sister have no guardian. There are, and in fact, the state takes care of him, but nobody really is responsible. So basically, Harford County Public Health takes care of this guy. So he just basically he just stopped walking, and normally he walks around. They took him to the ER. And in the ER, he doesn't speak. So he just makes, um, he sort of functions um, mentally uh, like a one-year-old, um, um, his brain. Uh, but his body, he can walk around, but he cannot take care of himself. Uh, he, can feed, he can feed himself, um, but that's about it. Uh, but he does walk around by himself. Uh, he wears a diaper. And um, he just stopped walking, so the caregivers didn't know what to do. So they can't just have this guy just laying in bed. So they just brought him to the um, to the ER. So you have any? <coughs> you have any? Um, good morning. Good morning. Come in. So do you have any experience with um, so this man? You basically have to treat him like a baby. Like like, have you done much work with children? Besides having them, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How about? How about you, Megan? Have you ever examined children? Have you ever done much work in children? How old? Uh, any child. Um, Zero, one, two, three, not ten. That young. Not, not that young. Not that young. Okay. But like six. Six. So, eight. so you can talk to a six-year-old. Yeah. So like a but so you can ask ask a six-year-old questions, but a baby you can't ask questions. So, so since you guys don't have much experience, I'll just keep talking. So, so basically, babies you just have to watch them. So you just have to just sit there. They, they don't take orders. So you have to sit there and watch them and kind of coax them to walk around the house or walk around or have mom see if, what they can do, put them on the table, put them on their belly, see, see what um, a motor of, uh, function they have. Um, so that's basically what I had to do with this guy. I just went in there and I just, I didn't know what to do because they, they told me he was paralyzed. But they, that's all they, they, he wouldn't walk. So I just, I kind of just put my hand out and he grabbed my hand. So I knew he had function of his, um, in his cervical spine and he could push me away. So he had C7, he could touch his face. So that's at least C5. He could raise his hand over his head. That was at least C5. He's breathing obviously, so he's above C4. So cervical spine's functioning. As far as his low, lower legs, he wasn't moving. So I didn't want to, I tried to say, move your leg. I mean, he doesn't respond, he just makes grunting noises. So then I, um, I sat him up on the bed, and then I, I just sort of brought him up to a stand, just myself, and he could stand. Well, that right off the bat, you know, he has a lot of function. And so if to stand, what's the most critical mo uh, motor group to stand? Do you remember? Quads. Yeah. Be confident. You, you know this stuff. Quads. <laughs> right? We go this over and over again. So you need quads to stand. So, like, especially in kids, if the kids don't have quads, they can't stand. I, I mean, th that's what you need. So he's got quads, which is a lot. 
And then I, I coaxed him to walk, and he could walk. And I, look, I was looking at his feet. His feet were clearing the ground. So what does that also tell you? He wasn't, he did, wasn't dragging his foot. He was clearing the ground. He was shuffling slowly. What does that tell you? <coughs> hmm? L4, L5 is working because he doesn't have a, a foot drag. He doesn't have a drop foot. So he's basically functioning. But he, wasn't, he wouldn't walk by himself. But then when I let him go in the hallway, he started walking by himself. So that's basically the physical exam. He had no clonus, reflexes were zero. So what, are your, what would you say, is he paralyzed? No. No, right? So what would you think, what would you like describe, how, how would you think, what's going through your mind at this point after the physical exam? In the story, history and physical. Otherwise he's a healthy man, 60 years old with Down syndrome. It must be painful to walk, which is why he would have stopped. Okay, it could be it could be painful, but he wasn't on exam. He wasn't he wasn't, he wasn't groaning and he wasn't. So what else? If it's not painful, what else? What what other reasons why could you just think? How about how about your kids? Sometimes when they won't do something, why? They just don't want, want to. They don't want to, or maybe he's afraid. You know that's that's the other thing I was thinking. So he's developed. I think this is my personal theory. He's got cervical ataxia, maybe. And he's just afraid to walk because his balance is off. So just like a child, they're afraid they won't do something, you know. But if you coax them, get them to walk, then they start walking. So maybe he's just afraid because things something's not right in his body, and he's tending to fall. And his balance is off. So you buy that? Mm -hmm. So th that's sort of what was going on in my mind on exam. So, so anyone think any other uh, questions you want to ask about this man? You don't have to have questions. So, so what do you think of the X-rays? Go, go. You're going to say something, Megan. Go ahead. Has he fallen recently? Like before he stopped. No, no right? history of falls. No history of falls. Mm -mm. No, that's a good question. No, he hasn't fallen. So, what do you, um, what do you think, Aaron, of the X-ray? This is not a trick question. Can you see anything? No, it's really hard, right? You can see that there's bones. You can see a mandible. And think about the x-ray tech trying to get an x-ray on this guy. Like, hold still. He's not, not going to hold still. Right. It's like a baby. So he. Can, it's really hard to get an x-ray on somebody like him. Uh, so at least on the side view, on the lateral view, you can see the mandible. You can see C2 here. C1 and C2. Three, four, five. On the AP film, his cervical spine on the front view is just a little bit crooked, a little bit scoliotic. So... Do you want to, um, so he's got Down syndrome. So what is uh, Down syndrome? Do you want to like say anything that you know or you want me to just keep talking? Just a genetic. It's just genetic abnormality. So I'm not an expert, but I just read about it last night, okay? So it's <laughs> trisomy 21. So it's the most common chromosomal abnormality that we know of. Um, and um, these are all the features. So quite often uh, it presents after birth. Uh, sometimes not. I remember my wife, she was an older gal when she had her children and she was tested. <laughs> she killed me if I, she knew I said that. <laughs> and, um, you know, she had the uh, needle uh, mm -hmm. and the amniocentesis, yeah, to see if it was downs. And, um, um, but, so, you know, quite often they just present uh, as a baby. So that's why you, um, you have to know what the children look like. They, have, they commonly have growth failure and usually they don't grow much, men don't grow much past five foot one, and women don't grow much past four foot nine, so they're small, statured. Um, they have mental retardation, and they're, um, the average, like, to be an average, in, I mean, intelligence, we measure it with the IQ test. It's just a test that we made up to see kind of how people do with skills and things, and the main problem is if you don't do well in the IQ test, if you don't get over 70, you have a problem with with daily life when you get a problem. Like so, let's like, say like your water heater breaks. You know, if you're mentally retarded, you just have a real hard time dealing with that problem. You, you can't like look it up in the yellow pages, call a friend, see how much it costs, look up how much, it, you know, you just can't go through problems. So life's very difficult. But if you have just, if your life is very easy, those people do fine, you know, but it's when a problem occurs that they have the, they, they just can't, can't overcome problems. So 70 sort of is our, just basically our human-made cutoff. 
with this test for whatever you know some people say the test is worthless but it's what we have to kind of understand intelligence so usually down syndrome is around 50 to 70 uh and iq testing so they can't function by themselves really but some can and uh, but it can be lower too 30 to 50. so our man is obviously he's not even on the scale i mean he can't he can't even talk so he's he's uh, he's more like a baby so they have mental retardation the back of their head is flat they have normal ears uh, their fingertips um, have uh, loops, they have extra creases, they have a, a crease in their palm that goes all the way across their hand. <coughs> they have intestinal issues, sometimes their um, uh, large bowel does not have um, innervation and they have constipation, so they don't, they, they don't their, their colon doesn't move basically, and they have a, what's called Hirschsprung's disease and they just constantly chronically constipated. They have hernias, some are born without an anus. They have congenital heart disease, like uh, defects in the ventricle or, or atrium. Their toes are spaced apart. So they have collagen abnormalities too. So the connective tissue of their bodies is defective. And that also happens, you can see they have abnormalities in the fingers, but also it happens in the spine. We're gonna get, we're gonna get into that, why, what kind of spinal problems they have. Uh, they have short, broad hands. And their basic abnormality is they have an extra chromosome. So chromosome 21, they have three instead of two. And that's a major problem. So anything you wanna add about? Oh, the other thing, their eyes, they have, um, I'm sorry, the most, most uh, the, the feature, the most important feature, they have slanting eyes and, and uh, um, their, their very distinctive appearance of their um, eyes and face and a um, broad, flat uh, face. So, the, you know, they have a flat face, bro uh, flat bridge of the nose, and uh, like a distinctive uh, eyes, like slanting sort of eyes. So, why do we call it Downs? Well, because this man, John Langdon Down, first described it. So Down syndrome occurs in one, one in 691 babies. <coughs> and Down was, um, was a medical doctor in London. And he decided, he was like a very promising doctor, a surgeon too. He decided to uh, spend his life taking care of these people. So back then they called it uh, idiocy, which is, you know, so what happens is any kind of term that describes mental deficiency becomes slang and we use it against each other, it becomes a mean word, so nobody uses the word idiocy anymore, but that used to be the word. And he used to, um, he took care of like a whole uh, hospital, and um, that was sort of his life work. And then, he, interestingly, his sons did the same thing, became doctors and took care of these people. And he first described a certain type of uh, person that has a mental deficiency that all the kids looked similar, and he called it Mongolism, because he felt it looked like, they looked like people from Mongolia. So for a long time it was called Mongolism. Boring. So why do um, why do older gals get tested? Because the incidence of Down syndrome increases precipitously as you start to reach forty. So I think I think it's like thirty five. It starts to increase. <coughs> That's correct. Thirty five. Yeah, after thirty five they'll do um, testing. They start testing. Yeah. So, but then it's like really at 40 that it really starts to um, elevate. So what what spinal problems do people with Downs get? They usually get C1, C2 instability. Kind of like rheumatoid though. Yeah, yeah, you could think of it that way. So the they rheumatoid uh, patients get the same thing. Um, rheumatoid's a little different because they also get panis, but they also get C1, C2 instability, you're right. So. C1, when it flexes forward, it should normally, in the neck, it should normally just flex forward a little bit, but, but like we said, C1, C2, if it flexes a lot, the spinal cord can, can get compressed here. And what happens is the patient can become totally paralyzed uh, from this type of problem or injury. So there was an article in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery where they, where they reviewed, I think it was like 100 children in a, in a group home or institution to see the incidence of C1, C2 instability because one child all of a sudden became quadriplegic, like all of a sudden couldn't move anything. They're like, what happened? 
and they looked into it and they found that the child had C1, C2 instability. So then they tested all the children and they saw that a lot of them did have C1, C2 instability when they flex forward like 20% or something. But not all of them were symptomatic. And this instability is the facets, the facets aren't working. So you look at, if you look at uh, the model, here's the model. Well, actually we can just, if you look at the model, so what, what is um, keeping you, Aaron, what do you think? I'm going to ask you, put you on the spot. What do you think keeps you from going like that, like C1 going forwards on C2? What structures? There's three of them. So what keeps, what's the check rein? What keeps the C1, C2 from flexing forwards? There's, there's three things. Yep, the, the, the transverse ligament that goes across the um, dens, behind the dens and then the facets and the two facets. So those things are made out of collagen. So if they're loose, the C1 can go forwards on C2. So here's a case of instability. Here's the extended view and here's C1 and here's the dens. You see that? And back here is where the spinal cord runs. So this person, when they flex forwards, here's C2 Here's C1. See how the arch of C1 is way forward to C2? And from here to here, that's all the area that's left for the spinal cord. We call that SAC, or space available for the spinal cord. The spinal cord gets severely compressed here. See how small that area is? On this view, you can see the area goes from here to here. It's not working up there? No. Oh, shoot. Hold on. I'll come over. No, no, no. I'll move it. Hold on. Uh... <laughs> oh, I see what I did. I'll switch it. Uh, yeah, you want to just come over here? I, I took a shower today. Right here. So, so the space available for the cord is from here to here. So that that's much bigger than here to here where there's instability. See that? Mm -hmm. So that's where the spinal cord gets compressed. Here's C1, arch of C1, and here's C2. And here's the arch of C1 and C2. I see how C1 is way forward to C2. It's hard. It's hard for you to see it because um, it's just not clear on the X-ray. Uh, let me, um, but you can see, you can see there that the spinal cord would be compressed right in there. So we have back with our guide now. So, so what, so here's, let's just go over ataxia. We went over this last week, but in ataxic and a spastic gait, quite often they scissor. This guy does not scissor actually. Um, and quite often they're bent forward and the, you know the description. The description for a child with ataxia is they walk with their feet wide apart, and that that makes sense because it's like a stable base. You know, because if you have a narrow, like, like in wrestling or any sport, they always say keep your feet separated because if someone hits you and your feet are together, you'll fall down immediately. You know, so the children figure this out too. So they have their they make their feet wide apart, and they go very slowly, like a like on a rough sea or someone who's drunk. And that's how this man walks too. Hmm? Short, gait. short stride. So that they don't lift their feet up off the ground. Yeah. Because they would want to. They don't want to be in single leg stance. Yeah, short stride, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, slow cadence, very slow usually. Okay. So here's the obliques. What do you think of the obliques, um, Aaron? They're much better than the AP and lateral one. Yeah, the quality's not so good, but you can see actually a couple things are kind of kind of interesting. You can see. Um, the foramina, like right here. You can see the, the um, facet here. So you can see the pedicle. That's a really nice view of a pe cervical pedicle and the foramen and the pedicle and, and uh, the, um, the facet. And you see how the superior articular facet below goes into the foramen? So we don't do a lot of foramenotomies, but that's what we remove mostly, the superior articulating facet. So if you look at the model, um, uh, uh, the f here's the frame and right there 
the hole, and you see how the, the usually the offending is the super articulating facet. You see the one from below. So when we do our frame anatomies, we do them from the back side. We make a hole right there, and we open it up, and then we're opening up that hole. And it, and we know if we go from pedicle to pedicle, that's why. And quite often in surgery, I was like, is this the pedicle? Because the the pedicle kind of like defines the space, so we know where we are. But his uh, he doesn't have much in the way of. Uncle osteophytes, does he? Remember in the, in the office, we would say, wow, that's a big Uncle osteophyte. He has no Uncle osteophytes. That's kind of interesting, right? That's interesting. Okay. So, if you go through the ER, everybody gets a CAT scan, right? And um, why do you think that is? Fast. Fast cheap. and cheap. Yeah. So, it's a fast, cheap test that gives you a lot of information. So, everybody gets a CAT scan. So, his CAT scan is really interesting. Let me show you a couple of interesting things. Here's C2, and here is C1. So is C1 really far away from C2, or is it close to it? Or it's close. It's close, right? So it doesn't seem that he has C1, C2 instability. How about the C2, C3 disc? Does it look normal? Flat. Dramatically decreased, right? How about C3, C4? Same. Dramatically decreased, right? Now, a couple of interesting things is that he has some element of rotatory subluxation of C1, C2. So here, <coughs> here's the, this is hard to know, but this is the occiput right here, and this is the C1 um, atlas. And see how C1 and C2 don't line up just right? Mm -hmm. But we know C1, C2 is not subluxated anteriorly, but it's off a it's off a little bit, so it has to be subluxated a little bit to look like that. Same thing here. See how from here to here it does not line up completely from here to here? So C1, C2 is rotating a little bit, isn't it? I'll, t I'll show you how, why I'm sure about it. How about um, C2, C3 facet? Kind of arthritic, right? Mm -hmm. C3, C4 is arthritic. How about C4, C5 facet? How about C5, C6 facet? What does it look like? Pretty bad. <laughs> Looks even fused, fused, doesn't it? It's kind of weird, right? Doesn't this look kind of fused? Mm -hmm. So he, he looks a little bit auto fused, doesn't he? Kind of weird, like kind of rheumatoid. Remember, you said it's kind of like rheumatoid. It's similar, isn't it? So here are the axial cuts. Here's C1, and the C1 vertebral body of atlas is kind of like looks like it's this alignment. Here's C2. Here's the ligament that keeps it from going forwards, and then C2 is angled like this, so they're rotated. You see how they're rotated? They're not. And I'll show you. I'll show you a perfect. Um, what it should look like. It should look like this. It should be straight, and this one should be totally straight too, although it's hard It's hard to see. But it's rotated like that. Can you see how that would mm -hmm. rotate? Now we do have normal rotation, like that's normal to rotate at that level. In it's, fact, it's like 50%, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a lot of our rotation. So for this guy, how much rotation? Remember we said the other ones are fused? He should have about It's probably all of his rotation comes from there, right? Yeah. So him subluxating, I mean, kind of makes sense, right? Because that's how he turns his head now. Because the rest of his spine, like you said, has, is a little bit rheumatoid-like. It's fusing. Everything comes from the top. Right. So it, he's, uh, it should be quite natural that he's rotating a lot. The other thing is that why does he have two lamina? A little bit like a trick question. Why is there two lamina here at C3, C4 in the axial cut? It's because the bones are subluxating and they're next to each other. And I'll show you what I mean by that, okay? So this is C1, C2, and this is C3, and then you can see a little bit of C4 as well, which is kind of weird. Okay, so this should look like, and that shows you how it's rotated. So, now, this is atlantoaxial rotatory instability. That's a condition that happens in kids. Have you guys heard about it? Some kids get this, and it's a viral condition where, the for some reason, the virus attacks the retro, you know, kids get viruses all the time in their face and throats, but sometimes the same virus attacks the joint at C1, C2, and they get this like really painful neck that's rotated and like torticollis. It's really, have you ever seen it? Mm -mm. Really scary, and sometimes it just goes away, uh, but sometimes it can become like a serious problem where the child's neck is stiff and curved a lot. So. You know, I remember when we were at Hopkins, we we put traction on it to try to get it straighter, and maybe it'll just go away. But if it's a bad case of it, sometimes these kids need a C1, C2 fusion, 
Needs to be reduced and fused, yeah. But this is not what this guy has. So just a couple more ideas. As you see how the facet of occiput, C1, C2, they should all line up ooh, like that. And this just shows you the these are the condyles that go to the head and C2 and the and the ligament that goes, the transverse ligament that goes across here that keeps C1, C2 like together. And this is what it should look like. Ox member, occiput, C1, and C2. See how normally it should look like? Look at his. See how it's off? See how it's off right there? And it should look like that. It should totally line up. So, and also the other thing is vertebral body and lamina. See how the, the top of the vertebral body is a little bit higher than the lamina? So, I'll show you some. And here's what the facet should like, look like. There should be a black line going across every facet, which is the joint. But look at his facets. See how they're all autofused? So, <coughs> like you said, you're right. He's a little bit like a rheumatoid spine, isn't he? Um, so, that's just, that's just not that's so helpful. So, here's his MRI. So, he came to the hospital and just had a CAT scan. I was like, well, we got to get an MRI to see what's going on. So, here's his MRI. How did you keep him still for the MRI? I, I, I didn't do anything. It just, you know, I didn't even think about it. He just sat still. Because yeah, it's good. Yeah, it is good. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. We just, I guess, just lucky. He, um, maybe they just gave him a pillow and he fell asleep. I don't know. The MRI, the MRI scanning techs, they're pretty, um, if you start moving, they, um, they they start getting angry and they maybe maybe they like screamed out sit still or something maybe he was scared anyway it worked <laughs> so so here's his MRI so what do you think is the biggest problem Aaron right can you see right off the bat you may want to look up top because I have to do this so that I have to bend the screen right um and the it's severe spinal cord compression great. right right here at the very top. Does he have any problems up at the t at C1, C2, in the spinal canal? No, well, no. He's Not got really, a large right? Area, posterior he's ligaments. got a really large area back there, doesn't he? So he's severely compressed right here. So you should probably look here so I can I can show you. Okay, but I can see it bent forward. It's fine. Hmm? Can you see it bent forward? Mm -hmm. Hold on, because it doesn't. It has to be like that. Can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's severely compressed here, isn't he? Like yeah. terrible. And initially, I wasn't sure what level that was, but that's at C3, C4. So let me show you something. This is the C. This is the arch of C1. This is the posterior element of C2. This is the lamina of C3, which is kind of a weird place. And this is the lamina of C4. And the reason why they're off is because everything's subluxated. See how this point here is behind this point here? So C2 is posterior to C3. And this point here at C3 is way posterior to this point here at C4, mm -hmm. isn't it? And he's all autofused here, C4, C5, C5, C6. He should have discs across all those levels. So he's he's got a lot of retrolisthesis, and because of that, he's compressing his spinal cord, probably as a result of this retrolisthesis. His, his vertebrae are not lining up. So here's the axial cuts. Spinal cord at C1, you can see the... Uh, Atlas of C1, C2, C2, C3. The spinal cord is not too bad. And C3, C4. You see how it's severely compressed. And this is the this is the lamina of C3. And this thing is the lamina of C4. See that? Mm -hmm. And when I measured it, it was uh, seven millimeters. And you see how the spinal cord is deformed here at C3, C4. It should the spinal cord should be should look like this normally. So he has severe compression at C3, C4. And this shows you now the, the you can see how the CAT scan shows the lamina a lot better than the MRI scan. You see, so this C2 and C2, that makes sense, right? C1, C1, that makes sense. C3 and C3, see how it lines up now? C4 and C4, see that? Mm -hmm. So now you, you agree with me, right? I'm not crazy. That it's, this is really his culprit. C4 is really compressing his spinal cord. Right there, this is C4. 
one more time so you understand it. C2, C3, C4, they're all shingled against each other due to the deformity and it's compressing a spinal cord right there. Okay, so that's it. So now what do we do? Yeah. So assessment. What's his so what's his chief complaint, you think? What's his main problem? Ataxia. Ataxia. Ambulance. Yeah, ataxia is his chief complaint. So what about this guy? Like do you know what the average age is? Um uh, lifespan for downs? You see a lot of it's like they don't live much past sixty. So oh, he it is. Yeah, so he's very it used to be really young, but you know, take care of these people. They live, you know, a long time, but they don't live. So he's a, he's a very elderly man for Down syndrome. So that just tells you his activity level, you know, is is very minimum. So what are the risks of uh, what's the treatment for cervical stenosis? <coughs> surgical decompression. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, only a surgical treatment. So you can just it's not an emergency. Um, but it's a surgical treatment. So in this man, basically we didn't have guardianship. So legally, legally really like, I, I really couldn't do anything. I couldn't get consent. And he had no guardian, he had no family, nothing. So we couldn't do anything. So he just sat in the hospital. Cause he was just, there was nothing we could do for him. We couldn't send him home. And we also couldn't send him to a nursing home. Because to go to a nursing home you need guardianship. Someone has to consent. So we had to wait. So I called the sheriff's office. They're closed. So I was like, and then I told the social worker, "You got to help me with this." So then the social worker called the back line, and and they had to get a judge's order to assign a man at Hartford County Social Services to be that guardian. And we just got that, and it took it took um, ten days to go through the process. So now we have a guardian, and now we got a plan. Where, uh, so we can do surgery in a week. We set a date. And um, and the guardian uh, agreed to uh, send them to um, rehab, so we can do the surgery now legally. So, uh, what are the risks of any type of surgery? Like, what's the risks of cervical surgery? Well, paralysis because you're at the level of the spinal cord. Yeah. Um, so we can make him worse, but he's not doing so well now either, right? Well. And it's a problem if you can't walk. I mean, he's going to be. He probably won't be as happy, I would think. You know, because it's it's fun to walk. I mean, he enjoys walking. You see him in the boy like walks around, looks around. So it's a big quality of life to be able to walk. But also, it's a lot more care because someone has to walk him. It's like so. It's probably worth the money for the state to fix his spine. You know, and also like what's fair is like as a human being, like have some compassion. Like this person, uh, you know, can be helped with the surgery. So, what levels to decompress? What levels to fuse? Three, four. So definitely decompress three, four, and two, three was a little bit stenotic, right? And then should we fuse those levels? What are the risks, benefits of fusing those levels too? Well, that's where all of his mo motion is since he's auto fused lower, so we're taking away some some level of motion. But I'm not sure how much motion occurs at C two C. Look how arthritic those discs are. I'm not sure how much motion happens at C two C three C three C four. But I would think a lot of motion does happen at occiput C1 and C1, C2. So the other thing is if we fuse um, C2, C3, C3, C4, C4, C5, puts more stress on C1, C2, occiput C1, C2, and he may develop what? Instability. instability, right? He may develop the instability that Downs patients get. So that's a risk too. So what, what, uh, what can we do to stop all instability? C1, C2, occiput C1, C2, C3. What can we do to stop all the instability? Exactly. Fuse the whole thing. Like remember last month, we, we occiput to C5. So we can do that for him. But now we're talking a much bigger surgery for this man who, like remember we said, he's, he's a very elderly man for his lifespan, you know? So we also want to cause a death, right? Because we want to first do no harm. So those are kind of like all the things I think that are going through my mind. What to do for this guy? Do you have, so do you have any uh, any comments or questions about options? So so this level. So and then the timing, like we said, the instrumentation adds one more element to the case. So so any other questions or comments? I'll tell you what my final thoughts are. I haven't done the surgery yet. I don't know. I would, I would 
would say keeping I would risk probably the instability at C C1, C2 at the occiput C1 to give him some sort of quality of life and his quality of life in the sense of like motion so his his neck can move and he can look around because he does do that he does he cruises and if that's if and he doesn't have any gross instability that can we can see of that we can be that it can be proved right now. Although it does subluxate a little bit on the CAT scan, doesn't it? Okay, so Megan said don't don't fuse C one C two. I would agree with her. I mean, she, he doesn't have much else. That's if you equated him like a one year old in the beginning. That's yeah, yeah. I think this, that's those are my thoughts as well. So so I don't think I should fuse C one C two. Let him have that motion. We're taking that risk, but everything comes with risk sometimes. I don't think it's a great risk. And then decompress half of C. So I was going to decompress um, half of C2. And, the, and remember, the reason why I keep, try to keep C2 intact is because a lot of the extensor musculature is attached right here, mm -hmm. a lot of it, to keep your head up. So we just cut half of that, take all of C3 off, all of C4 off, and maybe, maybe just a tiny bit of 5 to fully decompress the spinal cord and then just fuse those levels without instrumentation just pack bone graft into the um, facet areas we can use lamina we can I mean I haven't thought about iliac Compliance crest afterwards though well, I mean I think compliant I mean we can't count on any compliance on that right so I mean he's like a baby he's like a child he's going well, to start walking right away that, you know why not do instrumentation? I'm just asking. You can ask questions. Um, I mean, we can. I could do instrumentation. I guess it will increase the fusion rate for him. Um, it also uh, increases the infection rate for him. Usually, <coughs> usually, um, uh, cervical spine fuses. I mean, he already has been shown to be predisposed to fuse. He fused it without surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, usually cervical spines don't get non-unions. The other thing is I think um, even if he does not fuse, uh, I think it's it's very unlikely that those levels will become unstable because look at C2, C3, like there, there's almost no area, there's no, no area at all for the disc base at all. It looks like it's going on the autofusion anyway. So why make the surgery more complicated to increase fusion rate when we don't think he's I mean we don't I don't think he's going to get unstable at those levels even if I just did a laminectomy mm -hmm. because there's not much in the way of a disc space does that make sense so if you have like a large disc space normal facets and then decompress those patients are a lot more likely to become unstable you see so that, that they would benefit from a fusion now typically after your fusions you allow them to move am I correct yeah usually they, people do whatever they want Right, that's what I thought. There's, other, I know there's other physicians that don't. Yeah, keep people down or keep them or restricted keep them in, and embrace. Yeah, but collar. I'm right by saying that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it makes a difference. And uh, I like people just to just go back to their lives. I don't like restricting people a lot. I don't think it helps. So I think that the risks of fusing those levels is minimal. We just burr out the facets pack bone in it. It's not that much more surgery. It doesn't take that long. It'll slightly decrease the risks of instability. I think if you start adding instrumentation, it increases the infection risk. I mean, I don't want to get this guy get infected. I really don't want to have to do another surgery on him. And couldn't you use the lamina for the bone graft? Yeah, I could use lamina for bone. Yeah, I was thinking I was probably going to do that. Use lamina, local bone graft for him. Because he'll probably go on the fuse anyway, easily because he has a tendency to fuse. Also, the disc spaces are almost gone, so there's almost... For probably very little, limited motion at that level anyway. So those are my thoughts why not to use instrumentation. Does that make sense? All right. So any other questions about this case? It just shows the laminectomies that we're going to do troughs, our standard thing here, and troughs on, e on either side, and then finish it and pull the bone off, and then drill the facets out and pack the bone into the facets. That's my backyard last night. So any questions about um, Down syndrome? Oh, let's finish it up. One thing, one thing we, we all learned about from today's uh, 
conference. I'll start. I learned that. What did I learn? Actually, I learned that when the when when you get regular thesis and and loss of the diskite, you can really compress the spinal cord from the lamina. I was really surprised at the levels. And if I hadn't carefully looked at that, you can easily decompress the wrong levels. I mean, you really, I already knew this rule anyway, but preoperatively, you have to really understand the anatomy because if you don't, you'll do the wrong surgery very easily. And in complicated cases, it's really important to do things like this. So I learned a lot from him. Okay, Megan, your, your next one thing you learn. You gotta learn at least one thing. The, um, I just didn't realize how unstable um, Down syndrome spines could be. Yeah. Like, really the, and that makes me think of back to some Down's patients I've had. You've had some Down patients, mm -hmm. They can have C1, C2 instability, mm -hmm. But even if they have it, it may not be symptomatic. Like, right. Mm -hmm. But it's there. But, you know, with manual work that we do, Okay, great. Aaron, you're last. Um, kind of like what Megan said, it's interesting that you hear, when you learn the basics about downs and the, the hands and the feet, and you think of these physical characteristics, you don't necessarily think about how it affects more um, serious structures <coughs> in the cervical spine. Organs. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, actually, I liked seeing the MRI and the CT next Juxt to Juxtapose, each other. right? Yeah. And it's like I can probably learn a lot more if I just take time and start looking at things. But you never get that, you know. That's right. why it's only in cases like but, this that you get that. It's but interesting. sometimes when we look at non-union, mm -hmm. we might have a CT and an MRI yeah. that we can evaluate. And I just, in this case, it's necessary. But just in general, I think there's a lot more I can learn by looking at those two studies side by side. Yeah, it's really helpful to have both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Okay, great. See you next month.